Tell me when. Almost ready. Ten seconds. Down? Is it ready? I th Oops, sorry. I think we're ready to start. And there's so many people here we could... Ah, it's almost like a rave. Anyway, so I'd like to welcome you to SciArc and I'll begin very, very soon right now. We're all here to listen to John Jurdy and not to me, so I think I'll be as brief as possible. Simply to say that uh, certainly for the last 15 years, the body of work that the Jurdy Partnership has produced has probably, in fact, definitely been the most influential in changing people's image of what used to be called the shopping mall and now has to do with theme spaces or what I call scripted spaces with so many names for this process. And I have to say that as one of the people who often is asked to explain this from one place to the other, whenever I mention uh, Jurdy's work, uh, the enthusiasm grows. I was, just did it last week and it was that way again and so forth. In different, different countries, different cities, there's no question that the importance continues to, to grow enormously. And I think that the body of work uh, is worth the book that's going to come out on it and uh, I'm very pleased to have, have met John Jurdy. He's a very personable person. I think you're going to enjoy getting to know him and I just want to... Well, I, I, don't, I don't think I'll, I'll wax philosophically. I think, I think we'll let Mr. Jurdy do that and he's going to talk, I believe, in a much more personal way about a lot of his own work, his own sketches. So I'm really looking forward to learning a lot more about a, a person who I think right now is among the most significant figures in American culture. John Jurdy. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a lot of poop. The, the way I'm dressed right now is um, for Michael Jackson. Believe it or not, he just left my office a few minutes ago. I, I never look like this, uh, but he thought I looked great. So yeah, there we are. Uh, the, what he said about us, I think, is, is worth talking about for one second. When I was a student at SC, and uh, won a traveling fellowship while I was still a student to go around the world, what struck me was the, the life of the absolutely average human in many places who didn't even know they were having such a great life because it's the only thing they know. Uh, but the idea of bringing to common people um, extraordinary settings and, 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 a, and, a, and a quality of life instantly became my, my hit. Just before I got on the train or the plane to go on that trip, I wanted to be a Venice Beach celebrity. When I got off the other end, I wanted to be a, uh, a, a, every, an everyman architect. And in that regard, when I started to figure out, well, where are those, where, can I, where do I find, what do I do? It seemed like they were all in the shopping centers. And I don't really give a darn about shopping centers. In fact, I don't like them. But that's where I, I said, if so, then that's where we start. So we started in, in the shopping center world, which is a serious industry, like cars and you know, air, air, airplanes, that kind of thing. You don't just walk in and start telling them how to do it. It's a, it's a long, arduous, sort of vertical, greasy cliff to get to where you can start having some impact. Uh, and actually, I never really had much at all. Um, and, and quit. And then an old developer called me up and he said, Jerdy, that crap he used to talk about, his time has come, come out of retirement and save me in San Diego. And so I started that with that, the Jerdy Partnership. And we did a project in San Diego, which I'll show you. Uh, so the, 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 what we were tagged with, this idea of the shopping center architect, is only the kind of I'm not sure the Egyptians had this thing in the voyage of the soul. It was this, it's the smelly sea we had to go through to get to the other side. Then what happened is that with the American recession, we got invited out of America to Asia, and then all of, all of a sudden all hell broke loose because there, there 
we were not only invited to, we were absolutely, they insisted that we do everything our way, which of course wasn't the way it was being done uh, in a prototypical way in America. So the, with that, most you'll see, most of the exciting work we're, we're, we have is not in America. Um, right now we're working in every continent but Antarctica, and we have multiple projects in many, in Japan, uh, over uh, 10 or 15. Uh, China, probably the same, um, uh, the Philippines and Malaysia, um, and all throughout Europe now, England, Germany, um, Budapest, Warsaw, places like that, um, Canada, Mexico, South America, and whatnot. And, it's a, and, it's, and it, each and every one of these peace places add enormously to the richness of our lives. And I'll try to explain that as we get going. Um, there is a problem that's common to everybody, uh, but less common, I think, in Europe and in certain Latin South American cities, but very common almost everywhere else, and that's that our cities died. With the invention of the suburbs, there was a death. Now, like places like Paris, it didn't happen. Even though the suburbs are roaring, the core city stayed alive, but, the, but mostly uh, that didn't happen. Uh, the new ones that they created didn't realize they were supposed to be alive, so they, they're dead as well. Uh, what, what our company has been all about is how to bring things alive, to make them alive, either old things that are broken and don't work, or things that are brand new, and when we say alive, it means all of that stuff I was talking about, the quality of life, uh, experiential sort of thing. So that it has, in terms of the priorities of things to do, architecture is somewhat down the list. It has a lot to do with designing the experience or time, because that's what these people experience. They don't go in there and ooh and ah just about architecture. Um, the cities have very little to do with objects, except when they really need an object, like uh, Gary's museum or a cathedral or something like that. But other than that, it really has nothing to do with objects. It has everything to do with the field. And the field now, in this sort of super era we live in, is manipulable. You can, you can manipulate the field and create whole new fields. And fields, of course, means great, vast areas of habitation. Um, and the field is generally, and the biggest part, is, is a problem of experience. And so once again, we return back to the idea of dry design experience. But this experience is a complex issue. It has to do with place, event, change, and, and semiology. Semiology meaning this, the, the flag that it, your this, what a particular place carries. Is it a Chicago flag, or is it a Budapest flag, or is it a Romanian flag? In other words, I really feel very strongly that every place has to be imbued with the spirit of the host place. Because there's a thing about the people that use that place and, if, and a certain degree of familiarity they have to have, that, if, that it has a certain quality of homeness as well as it can be radically new and, and sort of over the top. Um, so, but what we did now, the place where all the concentrated energy happens in these fields, we call armatures. And armatures are where all the intense energy occurs. And so what we do is we design fields and armatures. Um, I think one of the things that, that's probably most appropriate here, uh, it's that it, in contemporary times right now, architecture very much now, and, and much more than architecture, seems to be about celebrity. And uh, it has a lot to do, of course, with all the obvious things in terms of media and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, we hope, we believe that, you know, once celebrity has occurred over and over time, it gets boring. So there's no such thing as celebrity anymore. We hope that if there's a next round of celebrity, it's for everybody. It's for all men to have a kind of equal kind of sense of celebrity. We very much believe in, in the pluralism. My company has nothing to do with me as a solo and single individual. It has everything to do with this phenomenal people of, a bunch of people that I have who are each in their own rights super candidates for celebrity. But they aren't, they don't act that way and we don't think that way and we don't promote ourselves that way. Um, there are, and our, and our firm boundaries don't go out beyond, I mean, they blur outside of the office because we have all these other people uh, that are part of the system, in, 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 in named individuals who are, which I'll get to in a few minutes. Um, what, when I did the Olympics in 84, it was, a, it was a huge act of total fear because we had no idea what the Olympics were. Most of the sports that we didn't understand, never heard of them. Um, and it was a very tight, little, tiny little team of Deborah's Sussman's firm and our firm. Um, and it worked. 
and what was it? Of course, the way it worked is it was so many venues we had to figure out some way of, of impacting them all. So we made a catalog of parts. It was that simple. You could have flowers and you could order the flowers. You could have columns. You could have tents. You could have all these various things, but you had to take them from the catalog. And we gave the catalog to hundreds of different design teams, and then gave them all the venues. And all they had to do was make sure they worked with the catalog, and everything else was op wide open. And it worked. We, we, we got back tremendous individuality and ex in, in separate expression, but then we also got this sort of family of, of, of herd-like quality that was occurred. And, and I didn't really understand what was going on at the time, and looking back, I go, whoa, that really worked. What was that? And that's what I call creativity, which has to do with this screwy uh, sharing of intentions and of, of powers and abilities. I, I'm so amped up about this kind of an idea. I really think the next big art form, right now, as you know, we're in a great big lull, a sea of mud, no clear clue what to do next. And I have a funny feeling that the next big one very well might be choir singing. It might be co-creativity taken to the highest level. The movie industry, of course, pioneered it and went way out ahead of everybody because that's such a strange industry. We don't see it separately. Uh, but I really think that that's the challenge of what we do in our company. There's, there are a number of heroes, but they don't think like that, and we don't think about them that way, and it all sort of keeps going on. The other people that we've been doing, we're so close to, is a guy named Jim Garland and, and Mark Fuller at WET, the water people. They, every project we do, they do. And we've developed over the years now a very good language. Joe Kaplan, who does all the lighting. Deborah Sussman, uh, Color and Graphics, and Cliff Salbert and Robin Perkins, also uh, graphics there in New York, so you got a West Coast, East Coast. Jerry Oka is landscape, and a guy named Hank Hockenberger who does our drawings. Now, I'm not going to show you any of Hank's drawings tonight, because I call them the Hallmark cards. We, they are done for our clients who require an entirely different kind of a document than, uh, than I would hope to show you tonight. So you're going to be seeing, for the most part, very crude original drawings. Most of them are mine or, or uh, the, off, the, the children of the beginning that move on and then into the very little about the final projects, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're doing. Um, the, the, if there's any time after we can talk about the space and armature and scale and all those kind of things. Um, but, but one of the, because this is all about globalism and so forth, what um, I was doing a, giving a speech in Japan, and a girl raised her hand. She said, how can you come from Venice Beach and tell me in Kyoto how to live? She says, I don't get it. And I, I said, that's a heck of a thing to say. And I said, you're right on the money. I can't. If I stayed there all the rest of my life, I wouldn't be able to give you the Kyoto you know. But I said, now, in this, because of this world of globality we live in, there's another culture that's, that's distinctly separate but coexists with the ones we know now. There's the you culture, and then there's the me culture, and those are, those are solid and unchanging, and there they go. Then now there's this new one called the us culture. And I said, what I'm trying to purvey here is the us culture, and, and it has everything to do with what you two tell me about your culture. And so that's basically what we're doing, is purveying this us culture uh, raw materials, which ho hopefully and very intentionally is not going to homogenize the planet, uh, but rather super hyper bring out the individual cultures that we're working with, which in our case right now are a vast number of them. We're just a design firm. We all, everything we do is in collaboration right from the get-go with somebody else, or in many cases, many other people. Um, so I'm gonna go through a whole slug of projects. I'm gonna move over there to sit because I can't see, and then uh, I'll come back up if there's any questions. Thanks. Okay, could you put the slides on, please? Right. Okay, this is Canal City in Fukuoka. This is the first project we did after we left America. It's a uh, many millions of square foot project involving two hotels, office buildings, retail, entertainment, live performing arts, and so forth. And it sits on a river, which in the right-hand side you see very just in the very right-hand lower corner. So we diverted a big hunk of the river and brought a canal in. And so everything comes out of all the human experiences on the canal. Uh, it's called Canal City. Next. On the left is a drawing I gave as a gift to, the, to our main client, a guy named Tosan. And it shows, in effect, the chambers that you experience as you move along the armature of this water body. 
and it starts off on the left with a cone and then a, uh, an arcing plane, then a, then a hemisphere, then a, a sine curve, and then a cylinder. Uh, and so the, the, those you can track on the far left, cone, arc, cylinder, sine, uh, et cetera. Next. You got your pointer. Yeah. Why? Why do you want my pointer? I don't want my pointer. Uh, this is the dumb design piece of the thing, which is the, uh, the canal coming in around the hotels and the cinemas and so on and so forth. We were working, our same client uh, had all these luminaries working down the street from us on a thing called the Nexus Project. And Rem Koolhaas started rattling that uh, to, to the president of our company, Eddie Wong, who was here. He said, geez, I hope you understand now we're taking your project over. Well, Eddie is the sweetest guy that ever walked. I've never in my life heard of him getting mad. He just about took the guy apart. But, all, but we, we felt we, we better get arty. So we made a clay model, sort of figuring we'd look like the Nexus characters. And so there's our clay model. Next. This is the big picture of it. The city, I mean, the, the river going along with the, with the branch there, and then the arcs you see. Where's my pointer? <laughs> Thank you, David. This is the project right here, right in here. And then there's the other river, and then the canal goes in and around there. And it's located right in the heart of the city. This is the eighth largest city in Japan, in this southern island called Kyushu. And we're surrounded by very powerful districts. This one is the original ancient Japanese shopping. Uh, they have these covered called things called the Kawabata Mall, uh, the main downtown street which is called Tenjin, which is the main sort of shopping and, and event zone. This pad, incidentally, is the Aldo Rossi Hotel, which is spectacular. Um, then up here is the main train station. Everything in Japan runs off train stations. So there's the project, there's the train station, there's downtown, blah, 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 blah. Next. This is a model of basically the experiential stuff. Originally, we wanted to do for children a an ecological uh, uh, kind of a terrarium, uh, but because we couldn't come up with what that meant fast enough, it turned into something different uh, and moved downwind. It became a, what we call the not a ball it's a sphere. Um, so that's just a, a simple diagram of the kind of spaces. This is a uh, probably a useless slide, actually. It just tells you what things do. Next. <laughs> this is the not a ball here. Uh, and that right there, that's probably almost 10,000 people standing there watching uh, whatever's going on here. This guy's lifting himself. Uh, and uh, the grand opening occurred with, uh, with me and all the Japanese. We had, apparently, there was an, the total GNP of Japan was standing right there. And I'll never forget, I have a little five-year-old son now, but when this happened, he was like a two-year-old, uh, was, was looking up in the crowd and seeing his face look a little moon beaming around. It was an unbelievable feeling I've ever had. Uh, and then at, just as soon as the, the formalities were over, a fog mist kind of came up. And it's the funniest thing was they played the Olympic music. Remember that da 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 kind of thing that and I don't even know how in the hell they knew that that was, you know, I don't think they, there was a relationship between them. Next. This is the sine curve, which is down here. Next. Uh, the nighttime, it's quite tarted up. It really has a great look, and this is just a kind of an example of it. Uh, and this is Clifford Selberg's work, which are these sort of Anazazi thinguses that, that march down the project, and the uh, and kind of a typical of the architecture here. And then the whole thing is all about little kids and having little kids things to do for little kids, and because Japan is a, totally a family city or country, and uh, and it's all about little kids. Next. Next. <clears throat> when it came to things like the superficial surfaces of things, why not in color, I said, why don't we make it like a, all the species of zebra? Um, they, they all have stripes, but they're not always the same stripes and so forth, so that it can lay together as a family, but it can also stay seriously separate in terms of its color and scale and texture and so forth. So that's what's going on here. All the building, everything is some, some sort of horizontality to it. 
and then uh, its own uh, encoded color. Uh, this is the, the one and only, this is just a hotel, it's the Hyatt Hotel, which sort of sits on an island, and then this is all the public space here, and there's just one bridge that gets you from one to the other. It, uh, it makes some tremendous uh, noises. It sounds like a dragon slightly throwing up or something around the corner there. It's got this gurgling, warm, sort of soft sound that it makes without any reason every now and again, which I think is the greatest because the timing is not, it's not rhythmic at all. And then all of a sudden it'll blow off with these two great fountain extravaganzas. Next. This really changed Asia with regard to what you can, what, what they were doing when, we, when they asked us to join them, is they had a completely opaque box with a door, and you went in this box, and everything that's in this project was in that box, and uh, they saw Horton Plaza, and they invited me over, and they said, we want you to build Horton Plaza right here, and I said, well, we're not going to do that, but we can do something, and they showed me their box, I said, why in the hell would you want to do that? He said, I don't know, that's why you're here. So uh, that's how the project all got going. Um, and so because this is not, not a box project, not a ball, not a box, the impact on Japan, and then if whatever impacts Japan expand, it impacts Asia. So there was a whole kind of a, of a uh, what do you call it, when Dolly split the eye, you know, um, kind of a, an aha that occurs, an epiphany. For by everybody that, gee, I didn't realize you could make ordinary life that exciting or that, that wonderful. So that this has then sponsored a lot of projects. And there's many, many sort of not so hot ripoffs of this thing going on. Next. This is Horton. This is the first project that we did. I quit architecture and the developer, Ernie Han, invited me to come back. Eddie Wong was right behind me here was my first employee. And he, I couldn't understand him. He'd just come off a plane from ch China. Uh, and the guys that then formed up around us um, are, and Eddie's the president now, by the way. Uh, we, we've stuck together pretty well all through the times. There have been certain uh, um, changes, but for the most part, it's the same bunch. And they just, we just keep getting, the learning curve keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Horton was a project that was absolutely an ordinary conventional shopping center. And we convinced the developer, well, he was having a hard time getting approved by the mayor as what was going on, who is now the governor. And, and he kept trying to sneak through these kind of croaky, ordinary projects, and he couldn't get there. And so then he remembered me, and he, that's when he said, Drew, do you remember that crap he used to talk about? He had me come down to do the thing. And so we had to do it, however, with the budgets that these things do. So it's just stucco, painted and no roof. I mean, it, they thought it was totally blasphemy that we wouldn't put a roof on the thing. And I told them that they're in San Diego. You know, you don't need a roof. Um, and so what this, this was very crude. I mean, it was a very highly, ex for us, very experimental project of spaces, a stepped side and a stacked side in this long axial building. And this is the one rich guy's building because it's got tile all over it. Uh, obviously, a, influenced heavily by San Miniato Al Monte. Uh, the, and the project's nothing but a diagonal through the city, uh, six blocks, and then I had assumed the diagonal would keep going to the waterfront over here. Well, the waterfront went that way. So, we, near miss. N next. This is the very first sketch that was done on the thing, just to, it creates the, the big move from the basic diagonal, then it begins to set pieces in it to begin to complexify the larger space. Um, and there, there it went. This is the one artifact that was on the site that was important. This is the thing called the old Balboa Theater. And this is an example of the cheap stack of walls. Next. These are, are sort of getting a little bit more under, understanding what's going on, the spirit of it. This is probably the first real drawing of the armature. And the armature is the space between that you see there. Next. Once again, when I was given this photograph, I couldn't believe my eyes that we'd actually gotten some in the ground and on its way, that it was actually being built because I had dreamed of these kinds of things for many years, but never was going to make it in the retail world. So it was pretty astounding when that came up together like that. Next. Next. This is a, down here is a, this was a wonderful gal named Joan Brown. I'm big on art, 
And uh, we had uh, a number of collab art collaborators in here. This is a gal named Joan Brown, who pa sadly passed away, who worked in a kind of mosaic, and she built this uh, obelisk. And down there is all these repertory theaters and so on and so forth. Next. <clears throat> That's enough. Next. Uh -huh, OK. This one is, what's it called? Rinku Town. No, it's Rinku Town, which is the, Rinku Town is the, is the, there's a triangular piece of land that juts out into the sea that grasps the causeway that goes out to the Kansai Airport, which is the, the major airport for Osaka. This is, and, you know, I think you'll see later a master plan for that, but this is a development on one of those large pieces of land, and it's very, very dense. Uh, and the put on the idea was that we would build a park sloped like a blanket would drape from down at the ground up to about eight or nine stories and then drop it quickly out on the backside and then create trails that would walk down this blanket to the bottom as one way of doing things. And then underground or underneath the surface, there is a, is a more uh, intense 500,000 foot thing going on. And then we had openings up to this, through the, the, and of course the blanket's a park. And we had openings then up to it, uh, it through skylights and various apertures that went through it. This is a transverse section through it this way, where you see the fast drop for the blanket here, then the slow one going down there, and then this happens to be taken right at one of the, right at the, the uh, canyon that runs through there with crossovers and so forth. This was a very exciting project. It was stopped by the bubble bursting in Japan. Um, and as, as yet, we await it to start, which it probably will. These are, are the, the, obviously the development buildings that are also on the site. Next, we've worked very, very much in Japan. We like it a lot. Um, this is a sort of a rendering of it from the backside looking forward. That's the causeway. Um, then here's a simple diagram of the movement through the green line uh, is the ex external movement on the surface. The red line is the organization underneath the park and the way move one moves around into it. And what I think is that's really important because the way the Japanese would have traditionally handled this, they'd have built a shopping center and then all these ho hotels and office buildings and it would have been an utterly jammed site. So the idea was to build a park that incidentally you can shop under, which then opened it up to kind of be a much more uh, agreeable place. Next. <clears throat> now, because I've had so much trouble getting these ideas of mine through the system, um, an entertainment came to me, an entertainment company came to me, and I thought, oh my god, all these two years I didn't even think about it. That's of course the right host for what I'm, the patron for what I'm trying to do because these people will understand entertainment. So the first big biggie was uh, Euro Disney. And uh, our work was, the, was a, essentially the, the armature, which is the main road patterns and so forth, and then nothing. I couldn't stand it. Uh, Eisner had just joined the company. The Imagineers hadn't really gotten deeply involved in it. Uh, or wasn't involved in it at all, and so we were the only people that were kind of there that sort of knew what in the world it was trying to be of, of any sort, plus we did the armature. So we began to do these things and end up with that thing there, which we call the discs. And <clears throat> there's a need, because this is 30 some odd minutes from Paris, uh, the, and it's 6,000 acres, the, the question was, you know, would, would you rather stay in Paris or stay out here at a hotel or have dinner or whatever? The answer is pretty obvious, and so what we got to do is something very serious to try to keep people there, at least for a limited number of days. Ergo, the disc, which is the urban core, and it would have all been built in one moment in time, and I'll explain it as we go along here. These are various, various organizational patterns or breaking downs of the disc that get really exciting. We have sp counterclockwise spiral canals that come down. It's, oh, by the way, it's a very flat hemispheric dome. Uh, this, these canals that work with their way down this way and then down this way, so that it's, a, it's a, a surface transportation system. Then we have a whole hierarchical system of boulevards, and then smaller streets and avenues and whatnot, and, and buildings in the conventional sense and all this sort of thing. Now, but however, they all have to conform to the dome. 
That's all they have to do is, is live up to the dome and zillions of architects could come in and do this just as long as they pay attention to the, to the height limit that would be required. Next. Actually, these two should have been flipped and reversed. These were the real early breaking down of the disk in terms of movement and separation, degradation, and all that kind of thing. That's the water patterns and all that sort of deal we went through. And we got really good at this disk stuff. Next. And what had happened is that uh, Disney was just getting in, in, into, into sort of its next gear as Eisner showed up because prior to him there wasn't a great deal of understanding about building reality. Um, and he, of course, was the, the master, the guru, so he, and, and this was all done to sort of high speed his knowledge up. That's the same disc with, the, with, the, with a very complex story about how, where everything is and what everything is that you don't want to know about. The only thing you need to know about is that's Disneyland right there. And so the main entrance is here. That's a, 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 an anywhere view of this lateral side of the disc. And you can see that the surface is teeming with life of all sorts, um, as it, it is not an, you know, a, a kind of a quiet icon. The idea, the reason for the disc is that it's iconic. This is a <clears throat> thing that will be built in one moment. Uh, it's, there's no need to place sort of coy about it and act like it was something that was built along over long periods of time. Uh, it also it serves as a, um, an icon for the Disney issue. Um, and, it be, and because of what our theory of the organization of this is, it, it, it is a metaphorical Earth. It has fossils and, and pieces of all of the planet there to be found or to be lived in. Next. There's a, there was the argument about the surface and why the disk and how one moved things through. This was actually done in a popcorn box flying out of Orlando, coming back to LA, where the whole thing came together. And uh, then, of course, there's a f not very much time, but some time between that and this. Next. That's the true life cross section through it. And what we did to keep the, tr the, uh, the roof height um, uh, valid all the time, but we, there were different density requirements. We just, instead of varying the top, we varied the bottom. So you see there's various levels, which, which then denotes various zones of density. Um, and then you, one does what one does when one uh, you know, moves from level to level. Uh, water was supplied from the Marne Valley right at the top of the disk, and that's how it all began to do its tricks. Next. Now, Disney didn't buy it. <laughs> so, but right then, MCA showed up, Universal Pictures. So we thought, oh, hell, we got a disc to sell them. <laughs> Great idea, you know. <laughs> so here they are. And th this is Universal Cities as you know it today with an amphitheater and, a th and the theme park and the movie theaters. And I mean, they were their biggest enemies, right? So I said, why not? Um, now. It's the same story. This is this all this this is however this is more literate than the other one was. We actually knew what we were trying to do here. There were there are districts of subset districts that have to do with making movies in the movie industry, offices, creative studios, sound effects, that sort of business, actual corporate office zones, uh, a touristic zone. Um, a, a kind of a retail zone, a hotel zone, and so on and so forth. So it's a very complex geography that goes on here. Uh, and that, and that's, therefore, this illustration is fairly accurate. As of, oh boy, um, 10 years, eight, whatever, whenever it all stopped. Uh, and there it is, laying in the landscape from, there's, um, I think I used to live there, uh, Barham Boulevard right over here, and then you drop down into this, into the, the, the next. Oh, then what I mentioned, forgot to mention is the only thing that's ever gotten built is City Walk, which is right there. That piece got built. And now we're in the process of building the next piece, which goes over here. Uh, this, these were more exploration. You can see I'm really big on these wigwag deals going down hills. Um, next. That was very early, this one, where we had uh, more, much more ambitious, and as it became clear what we really could do, it simplified itself from here. 
And then we knew that two things were the, really the big ch challenge here was, first was who was the audience? Who's going to use this thing? Was it valley people or basin people or both or whatever? And we couldn't imagine that both would. And so that was always a great challenge. And, when the, and the audience that ended up actually using it was a great surprise. We hadn't expected that at all. But it all seems to work fine. Uh, the tenanting of it was very poorly done, and so it has a kind of a bad reputation as kind of a no place place. Um, but I think that's been cured now. And I've taken enormous heat from the academics for this, but I stand by my spotlights. Next. <laughs> Klieg lights. Okay, that's what did get built, City Walk, and here you see it going through there. And it's, this is the first, the guy that was the developer head of MCA, and, and MCA had never built anything, ever, except for this sort of stuff. He was so timid that he only wanted to build one side of the street. He said, let's build one side and see how it works, and then if it works good, we'll build the other side. So we convinced him to clip off the ends instead, so then it came down here. Uh, and this has, it all has this complex sort of districtizing of different, so we really believe in districts, districts for children, districts for outdoor recreation types, district for sinners, district for nighttime, you know, all that kind of thing. So this is, that's the district diagram. Next. I suspect most of you have probably seen the place. What the theory of it was, uh, was that it was a metaphorical LA. This was an architecture that you'll never find in LA, but had LA kept going uh, the way of most cities and its density got up, this is an architecture you might have found. And LA, the language of LA we thought was cheap stucco boxes layered, so, and then towers on corners. So that's what this is all about, is layering on a very simple stucco background with then the creation of towers. And you gotta remember this is a movie company, so it gets fairly amped out of its skull here as it keeps going. Um, and that it, for, it was primarily a night event because the, the tourists to the theme park were guaranteed people. They had to use the city walk to get to the theme park because they had to come from the parking to get there. And they did, don't, don't do very little in it in the daytime, but then in the afternoon when they're returning and everybody else starts showing up, the locals that is, uh, then it starts to, to really uh, get moving on the inside. I'm so pleased that they're gonna finish the other half of it because and also if you, by the way, if you were to stand on one side and look at it, you'll see the, the, the arc of its, the, carrying its piece of city, of the, of the, uh, the flat hemisphere, the dome. Next. Uh, one of the funny things was this round area here, which has that uh, space frame kind of thing on top of it. We built one of those by default downtown, and the, de the development guy loved it, and he wanted to put it here. We said, well, wait a minute, this is a street. You can't put that on top of a street. It's, it's a street. Well, he said, who's, who's paying the bill or something like that? So we ended up putting this thing that, oh, it's over there. I've never really, to this day, quite understood it. <coughs> That's the Hard Rock Cafe, which kind of, I think, thrilled everybody out to keep going and start to try to overwhelm it, because this thing was really something. And I'll, if only there was the right day, I'll tell you this true story about that building. Next. Right. <laughs> this is a thing called Kivan Malate. It's 22 million feet. It's about the same size as Century City uh, in Indonesia. And it's similar to some of these other things. And now, what happens with us, by the way, if an idea doesn't happen, it, if, if it disappears or whatever. We just keep trying the same idea until we finally sell it and we move on to the next idea. So this is the same idea, the sloping park plane with very utile space underneath. It doesn't need to be a building with access to the uh, sun and the, the sky via channels that are carved out through its surface. And then in this case, we have a whole series of hotels and office buildings and residential buildings. Now these are what you call Greek, these are really not the design of the buildings, these are just placeholder buildings that are sort of doing their job. Uh, what was got really interesting here was the, was the chamber, the creation of the linear, of the string of, it's like a necklace of pearls, of chambers of various types, and there was a great deal of work done on these various chambers, which now are, <clears throat> you know, in the drawer. This didn't happen and won't happen, so we have a, we've got a whole year's supply of stuff to run on. Next. This is an example of one of the chambers. This is the movement pattern. 
which is very complex. It's that same zigzag, but it was a zigzag that keeps crossing over itself. It became quite something as it gets complex, but then it's laying on other grids. So you've got grid on, I mean, a, a gridish thing on top of a grid on top of a grid, and that gets very interesting um, as you be, as, as that becomes more intelligent. Next. There, this is, the, this is the systems that are overlaying one another. One is the hill. The collar is the thing that goes around, the, obviously, the outside. The other one is the linear shopping armature. And this is the whole thing all bundled together. That's the armature, the shopping armature, which is the absolute out of the textbook one. Next. The, these, by the way, are done. Not, they're not real to happen it from these. They are, these are marketing tools that they now go around and deal with the, po with the political possibilities, the, um, the tenanting possibilities, the co-development possibilities, the money and all that sort of thing. These are all, all created for that, so to that end. And then if this is, makes it, then it will come back again and in, in effect it starts all over again. And with, but now uh, we will have the time and the intelligence and the understanding of what it really is to be, to do it for real. So that's almost always how it happens, although we get caught short sometimes, but they just turn around and build what we did. And uh, that's always a little hair-raising, but there are, some, there are some incredible people in the company that, one particularly, sitting right behind me, who gets things built in the most extraordinary way. Matter of fact, everything he touches gets built. Everything other people touch does. Anyway, next. <laughs> No, that's more of that same thing. Next, that's enough for that. Okay, this was a really good one. This is Rotterdam. The not, this is the key intersection in Rotterdam right there, which is right here, right there. And that was the Nazi target for the bombing of Rotterdam. They just completely blew this entire zone out. Then the Allies came in and did it again. So, I mean, this thing was completely wasted, and they've rebuilt it. Marcel Breuer did this building right in the corner here, and so on and so forth. But the problem is they built this gigantic highway that cut the city in half. So the project was to uncut, the, to, re, re, to seam the city back together again. So this silver looking thing you see going through here, a lazy S going through there, that is a, that's this, that is a kind of an airfoil that, that slides through the city at the grade, at the plane of the city, which is right here. And it also protects the upper plane of the city and the lower, which is now this trench. You know, this is canal country, so they really thought this was great. This was a canal of people going from one side of the city to the other and then back up to the plane of the city here. And all the major hub of transportation is right there, the subways, buses, parking cars, and the whole thing like that. This has uh, been very successful. Next, it's called the Blur Spleen. And this is it from a kind of an angle. You can see it streaking through there. And then this is it sort of in this piece. And a lot of interesting subtleties to the project. There was two sides of the new project that was unearthed. One of them is a project that is the ancient side, which was built of ancient materials in the ancient way. And the other one is the modern side. Um, and most of this stuff is new users. Uh, and of course, new space. Sometimes it's old users and a new space, and so it's. But it, it's tremendously successful. Next, so, and again, next. Oops. Uh, the night view of it is quite something. It's very good, incredible. And by the way, it's a it's a great. It's a huge people. People are there all the time, day and night. Uh, it's funny, when you mark a city in a unique way, people go to it because you marked it. It's, un it's unusual. It's kind of like if you build a pier, everybody walks out to the end of it. Next. Okay, this is a, this is a, uh, a Lulu that's underway right now. This is called Namba. Right there is the Namba station, which is the largest and most active station in Osaka. This is Osaka here. And our site is this vast site that goes all the way out to here with a stadium that's in it that has to be eventually taken down. Uh, and our project has the, is the vast site. And then that red thing has got to be a um, plus five meter walkway that takes you all the way through the city, open to the air, 
Uh, so that's really at the, at the next level. And then the idea is to develop all sorts of stuff around that. Now, <clears throat> the, the Osaka newspaper said they wanted to, they were asking various people who were impacting the city in a big way what the first dream of the new year was. And could I make something about what that first dream was? So that's is the thing I gave him to put in the newspaper, which is the Namba project. And this is, if you would know how to read the thing, which nobody did, would, that's a plan of it. And that's a, that's a section looking into it. So it's, these, it's this very plastic uh, sort of thing. And what it amounts to is to take a thing which is right at the grade of the city, and it gets very hostile as you move off in these directions, and then this plane lifts up to eight, nine stories at the end here and down to zero there. And so the walkway stays at the second level grade cutting through it. And of course, what I've created is two loafs. And then in those are all the util functions. And so we have the main uh, outdoor canyon, if you will, here. And then we have the interior canyons, this, the branch canyons here. So they, le they, they leave and then rejoin here. And I'll show you more about this. But this is the most exciting project for us right now, one, one of the most exciting in the office. Um, and uh, it's it, it, the biggest, every time we come up to this point where everything is really exciting, Japan has an economic event that puts everything in danger. And so we're all holding our breaths, but it's, so far we, we're making it. Uh, there, <clears throat> there's a very high sensitivity level, however. Next. This is it in the model. That's the canyon that moves through it. This is the, the park on the top um, with this whole series of, uh, the park is highly active. It's not just a look at park, it's a play park. And so with, with amphitheaters and all sorts of things moving down through it. This is the simplistic version of the canyons. There's the outside canyon and then the, the figure eight is the inside canyon and the ABCD are the chambers that interlock what's up to eight levels on, excuse me, on this end, and let's say about four levels on that end. Next, next slide. The, well, I am really, we are really interested in um, sort of going back to where Sullivan and Wright, those guys left off, and I, very much so um, Gaudi. I just came from Barcelona, and it was so astounding to see how close to the, to the, for, to the, to the forms that nature's forces create. For instance, this, which is a water-carved uh, piece through stone, as a source for, um, uh, in a funny way, of inspiration of the thing. And when you remember, we're not real thing conscious, so that it's, but it has its part to it. So this was the Damba project uh, in plan then with the two loaves folded up, one on that side and one on this side, and, it, and the, the canyon, the main canyon, would be then very seriously worked into with cavities that were pressed into it. And I had just come from the canyon where the Anazazis live in these great uh, uh, hollows out of the cliff walls. I was very taken with that. Um, and so, the, so this is the life along the lower canyon, and it's also the way the, all the upper canyons come through and re-encounter re with the lower canyon. Then right up at the very top, we have a, a pond which spans the, the lower canyon with a little sort of crystal bowl, so the water will span the canyon and sunlight will come through and create, a, I think, a marvelous sort of daylight in the down, which will be, could be fairly gloomy down the bottom. Next, now, this, by the way, is how I work. This, this is a project with a fellow named John Alexich and me, and these are scrambled as to who's what, and it doesn't make much difference, but that's me and that's him. Um, and this was beginning to sort of understand the canyon and messing around with it, and the beginning of the canyon wall look. This is probably a little more intelligent, more disciplined, if you believe it or not. Uh, study of the same idea. We've, there are thousands of these that, of course, are done to kind of arrive at whatever. And I always get sort of amped up about making documents, you know, so I put gold paint all over the thing. Next. This is the simple idea again with the large canyon, the interior canyons, and the chambers that are subset there. Then a kind of an, over, um, um, an overview of that same idea, looking down at everything put together. It's all the movement patterns. Next. 
This was a couple of sketches that I did on the weekend with John Alexich, because uh, what had happened is the project went dormant for a very long time, and we had to go to Osaka to rekindle it and with nothing to show. So we did these two drawings, and believe it or not, it completely transformed the whole thing. They were, got so thrilled out, they said, go over there and build it. If you look like this, it's like what I did on my vacation, you know. Um, but it worked, and so then the drawings were but it, this is not very far from what we actually are building. It just doesn't look precisely like that. Next. These are the subsets, kinds of spaces that cut into the canyon walls. This is a space that wraps all the way around and is serviced by these lateral subspaces and movement systems that come from and across and up and to and then leave below it. This is a very large space. I do, we didn't show, I didn't put it in the show today. We're building a gigantic sphere in Taiwan that sits in a, in a gigantic cube, which is hollowed out to hold the sphere. So the sphere sits in like that, and then the hollow is like this. So the same kind of spatial thing will be going on there. This is a typical ledge along the canyon wall, because everywhere in the canyon, at various levels, you should be able to come out of these ledges and there will be various reasons to go out on them, food or, or events or music or whatever. And then, of course, you have this very spatial contact with the rest of the, of the, the life in the canyon. <clears throat> Next. These are, there was a, a tremendous amount of time spent in the study of the chambering of those things that grasp the inner canyon and how one chambered them and how light came down into them and so on and so forth. So I just brought two of these to show the kind of thing we were looking at. That's the main canyon. These are the two side canyons. Next. <clears throat> That's one of the really er early studies of the canyon walls. We found out, we kept trying to draw it, the wall of the canyon, to get a better idea of it. And it kept looking ridiculous. And we realized that there was no way in the world you would get this sense of the reality of that place. It's, it, you know, there's the two halves. Isn't that right there? Between the two red lines. And so it really isn't that about that at all. It's about a progressive and sequential set of views. Once we got that right and started working in models and turned, instead of trying to do it in drawings, it all began to come get together. These are the bridges that cross over the canyon. And the interior inside the mountains or inside the loafs, it's uh, air conditioned. And so these are the sealed conduits that take you, span the canyon, wherever they are. We tried to keep those to an absolute minimum. You can also sense the problem here because we have, uh, this is the, the, the elevated walkway at the second level. There's another floor that's below here. Uh, every time we go up, we lose part of a floor. So the floors keep getting littler and littler and littler. Next. And this is more studies of the cavities and how one could get into them. And the, actually, this go, goes on now. We still are doing this kind of thing. Next. This is the model that kind of tried to freeze it at one level that shows that's the whole entire site. Oh, by the way, that, that thing I showed you of where the project is, that site's like that. So all we're doing is this piece, the nose is right there, and it's in two phases because the, the existing stadium is right there, and they have to build this, and this is going to young believe this. On the ground floor right there is the off-track bedding thing about we can't, whatever we do, stop that from being in business. So you can only build half of the project, the, 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 the pointy half first, and then relocate these guys, and then move them into that part, then you can tear down this part. Do you see what I mean? It's really funny. Um, this is an amphitheater. It's up on the thing. That's, of course, the main canyon, the bridges, and so on and so forth. I mean, I don't know if you can appreciate at all what's going on here, but. There's the canyon split. Those are the cross bridges and so on and so forth. Now, what gets weird about this, I mean, this isn't really a building. It's not really a, it's a funny thing, you know, what it is. And, and however, it'll present itself to the world as if a building and it's being treated that way. I'm not showing you anything about that. That is how its presence occupies the city. And then it has these other people's buildings coming up out of the ground. Um, and one of the funny things here is one of the big, huge Japanese firms, that was the design we were, were going to propose. Well, they got it, and they couldn't deal with that point. So they had to stick a big square on the end of it so they would somehow be resolved. Maybe there's a feng shui problem or something. 
Next. That's it, that's sort of split open and so forth. Next. This is really an exciting project. I don't know if you can appreciate it at all from this pretty crude stuff, but next. Now Stephanie, who's sitting right beside me here, she insisted I do this. So I, here it is. This just shows you these are the util spaces in the floors, color-coded by virtue of the use, and the gray is the negative space. Next. Next. <laughs> yeah, one more. And this is the, the geography. See, there's that box sticking on the end of the, our building. These are the two uh, towers, which we probably won't do. Um, the canyons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is a gigantic entertainment thing about it that comes in up here. Now, this project will have, you know, not very long from now, we'll have at least eight or nine major firms. We're doing serious pieces of it, such as these and that and what so forth. And we're all, we're designed to let that happen. And that's what co-creativity is all about. Um, and of course, sometimes it's a tough slug, and it is right now for us in Mallorca right this moment. I'll show you that project. Because we're having a heck of a time taking, getting a US Spanish accord going here. Next. <laughs> okay, this is a, another really good project. It's, it's called the Densu headquarters in Tokyo. And this is a, a combined, very large piece of land right next to Tokyo Bay, which is right there. And it's in the Ginza is right here. So this is a place that isn't. It's not the Ginza, it's not the sea, it's something that's between. And yet it's gonna presume itself to be the headquarters for the Dansu Advertising Company, which is the largest advertising company in the world. Nihon TV, the major television network through of all of Japan, a major hotel, and then a, a little bit more of a vaguer idea that's coming from Mitsubishi here. So the project began, another fellow that's in the room here, uh, Arthur, uh, we started off with the idea of it's three separate sites. We were, our first commission was to make a single place out of this. So our idea was to shape the land, take all three sites and have them live with this kind of an overall topography. That is a, a, a very gentle up ramping series of slopes that then go into a basin. So in the basin, which would be right in here, you have essentially the major definition of place. And then as you move out in the wings, which gets very difficult to hold, you, you've now left and that's, that's an okay idea. Next. And then this is what would happen as you insert the, the actual, the, the negative spaces of streets and whatnot. And, you know, as you know, the Japanese are very nuts about building these upper walkways, these second level walkways that nobody ever walks on. They go miles through the city and they're empty. But they always do it, so here's one of them right here. Um, now, so the project here, we, 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 are, the, we have all three sites to do eventually. I think Richard Rogers is working on this one, and I'm not sure who's doing that one. Um, and this one, the, the tower, the Densu Tower, didn't ex exist yet. We, and so that we were having lunch and, and uh, they wanted to have a kind of one of the bigger American tower firms do this, but they had just disbehaved on another project that we were with them on and they kind of lost their, uh, their union card for a while. So I said, well, what about John Nouvel? He's a guy I've always admired. And they said, hmm. And then lunch was over, and two days later, I get a call. It's John Nouvelle. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I've never seen anything that fast in Japan. What I found out after it got all said and done is I don't even know who John Nouvelle is, and he's never done a tower. <laughs> so he is, however, the tower architect, and he's a fabulous guy, and he's doing a tremendous job. So it's, it's, it works out, works out extremely well. So this is Nouvelle's tower, and this is my site. Well, the very, all the rest of it's my site. Next. This thing began for me uh, in a farmhouse in, in up near Bordeaux in France where I was teaching in the summertime. And it was, it was in the evening and, it, and all of a sudden I got this, this big flash of aha. And the only paper in the whole place was um, the stuff they wrap loaves of bread in. So this is flipped over bread loaf <clears throat> with a plan of the, the, uh, the, our project, or no, Nouvelle's project the tower, his tower, our project here, 
which would be a, a topographic thing that would have this series of beer can-like negative spaces going back in it, covered by a glass garden that would come down like this to the bottom. And so that was that drawing. Then I tried to make it three-dimensional in this drawing. So this is how it all began in one night <coughs> in France. And the funny thing is the fidelity has held, held all the way up to now, which is quite remarkable. Next. <coughs> These were then closer looks at our part. What I was trying to do is be a non-building. I was trying to sink myself into the ground and kind of be a no nothing, but like a garden. But I had to be a very intense garden because I had a lot of activities going on inside the garden. <coughs> so as <coughs> to not detract from Nouvelle's <coughs> very serious object building, and there's certainly no need to have two objects fighting with each other on the site, so we, uh, we opted to back into the landscape. Next. But this is how we work, and this is, in this case, how I work, are the drawings that are sort of this degree of, uh, of um, definitiveness. And then they're moved on then into the team and off it goes. And now I don't much care if they totally change this idea entirely, as long as they change it for a better idea. It's the only thing that's of, of interest. I mean, of, of everything is of interest, but I mean, the only thing that I would worry about. So the need to, to maintain the fidelity of what I've drawn is not there. Next. <coughs> so, sorry, <coughs> just checking everything. <coughs> so this is a model of, now we got really zapped right in the middle of the whole dang thing. This thing was so graceful and so beautiful. <coughs> and there's a, a a cockamamie performing arts theater back here that used to run this way, the main axis, which gave us all kinds of room to move up and over and everything. And the two owners of the, of the theater, of theater complex and of, the, of Densu got together, and he was complaining that his loading dock wasn't on the sidewalk level. <clears throat> now, in this project, everybody in there, anyone will ever come here, any human living will come in on that level right there, because that's the connects them to all the transportation systems. There is not a human life will ever go on the sidewalk. But because we had to move the loading dock to the sidewalk, we also moved the theater to the sidewalk. So it has its main entrance on a place nobody is. And the people are down there. So, but in any case, we had to kind of in the last minute torturously warp the scheme that we have. We thought, we thought it was not even going to make it. Uh, but then, and, and it's just generally, they're barely making it right now, but this is where it is right now. There's Nouvelle's building going up there, and there's us. Next. And what it is, is this glass garden. It's a parallel walls of glass that are built around the structural system that spans this ovoid negative in this block. Just think of it as a block of rock that's then uh, been hollowed out and there will be three realms of landscaping. There will be the realm on the ground, and then in the space between, this is about 15 feet, and about five meters open, that's a greenhouse. So there's all these espalier vines and plants growing in the glass roof, and then on the upper, on the roof itself, there are certain zones of landscape up there. So you're gonna get this incredible, um, what would you call it? this? Is like a doily. This effect of, of landscape, and these are these are uh, vines. You know, uh, what's the name of that one? Wisteria. That the big, large, gnarly, knotty vines that will be growing in here, creating these these rosettes of landscape going around, uh, and and people can walk in it. Then the the actual useful stuff is terraced, as you see there, and then the beer cans go through in here, which then access a much larger piece of space underneath Nouvelle's building. Next. This is the kind of overall big picture of it. That's our project. That's Nouvelle's project. And then see, we're, we're sort of right in this zone here, repeating up uh, there. And then this is underneath his building. We actually do everything under his building, and then he takes off from his building up. The working relationship with him has been amazingly good. And we protect each other, and we've gone along uh, through time now. It's been extremely very, very exciting and very good. Next. 
we went to a, uh, a very important meeting with the Dentsu people, and I had Arthur, the guy who's done the primary amount of work here, who's sitting right behind me, a couple of chairs. I had him run out and find a rock, Dawn, and he was running around. We're right on the Imperial Gardens, right? So he snuck in and stole an Imperial Garden rock. <laughs> and then I asked him to steal a crystal vase. And I wrapped him up in towels. And so I came into the meeting, I put the crystal vase down, and I said, this is Nouvelle. And I reached down and I pulled this old rock. And I said, this is us. And so that they understood that there was a clear-cut difference between what he wants to be and what we want to be, are totally different. And everybody got it, and so I went home and framed the rock. Next, next slide. This is Nivelle's building, and, and it, it has gone through a great number of gestations. If any of our projects have had the hardest hit because of the economy, this is the project that has it. But it's all barely holding together. Um, this is a big cooling tower, and there's our glass sandwich that goes up there, and then this, the rock, in effect, fitting around it. These are the, the kind of the, uh, the glass that fits on here, which we sort of visualize as kind of an insect wing kind of thing. Next, Las Vegas, I, I just ended my Vegas, well, maybe not, but I mean, almost ended it with the opening of this unbelievably, ridiculously expensive hotel. But in the middle of doing all that kind of stuff, this is downtown Las Vegas, where all the movies have been shot and everything, and, uh, and it, was, it was going under, because all the stuff that's up on the Strip, which is about five miles away from here, which had all these extravaganzas of you know pyramids and New York whatevers and Paris and all this kind of stuff, they were in big trouble. So the idea was to try to do something that would bring them back, at least to hold their own in, in this degradation. And um, the guy who got me into this project has been the client for these other resorts and stuff with a guy named Wynn. Uh, and in a, in a very quick period of time, we conceived the idea of putting this thing in a tube of light. And I wanted to, wanted to remove all the street appurtenances at his curbs and everything, and then have a, the, the ground slope very gently to the center, and then let a little film of water weep over that so that it was a reflective surface. And then this thing, as you'll see, is a giant source of light. And then, of course, you've got the wall of light of the casinos themselves. So you then would complete the tube. Now, the original idea was to have a flying parade. It, the very, it's, it's sort of some kind of regular moment every two hours or something. Something like these big doors would fly open and this thing would go down the main back and then disappear. And that was the attraction, right? And so it got to be more and more difficult and more and more scary trying to make machinery that will last every night throughout the year for 20 years and all that sort of thing. And I went to Rome and uh, Ming Fong was there. And she took me and showed me um, anamorphic perspective, which is uh, an incredible way of painting so that we're from a unique viewing point. Everything jumps out and becomes three-dimensional. I thought, wait a minute, I can do an anamorphic parade. I don't need to make a real one. I can do it on the here. So that's what made the biggest sort of incremental jump forward in this. It's 2,000 feet long, 100 feet wide, 100 feet Hi. Next. It's four blocks with one more yet to come. It's this big tube, relatively cheap tube that goes across everything that is lined with a electronic film of a um, million six hundred thousand pixels, and each pixel is made up of four lights itself of the three, three primary colors in white. It's all open to the air. It's not closed. It's just it's just like screen, and so in the daytime, it's a it's a really beautiful <clears throat> sh sh shade and shadow pattern, and then at nighttime it goes ape. Next, this was the the sketch that was done very quickly about the the idea of the the tube, and then this was the, supposedly a flying parade going through there, and then this dip. Uh, this is it as it's constructed today, but not doing its trick. There's 760,000 watts of sound that are hanging from the ceiling. Um, costs, I don't know, it was 72 million. 
which bought a lot of other things, parking garages and many and, and street improvements and all sorts of things. Next. <clears throat> now what happens is that about every hour, the, the whole thing turns into a screen of, of animation. Um, the first thing that there's, there's shows, there's various shows, and the only one we really had a lot to do with is what's called the first show, which this isn't. Um, but it starts off with the sound of eagles, and then all of a sudden this whole flock of eagles flies through and then turns around and flies back through. And then jet, it's right near Nellis Air Force Base, and so these jets go through full si si scale, I mean full speed, with all the sound you can imagine, you know, going by which then starts this whole great sort of program show. That's the real way it got built, what it looks like, and it doesn't touch anything of the street. That's all treated as if it's museum quality sort of things to keep hold on to, but rather contains the street. Now the budget got snipped, so we had to kind of resort to a different thing, hopefully, to catch reflective light. Those are all little spheres, uh, reflective spheres, because we, then we can only pay for that much. Next, and it's, if, you, if it's worth seeing, because it's quite something. And it, this, this thing, as I said, these ideas travel. This began in, in New York City in Times Square on a project that we did build, actually. This was called the whiz bang. This was going to line the thing in a vertical way, playing to the outside, and now it's turned into a, it didn't get built, and then it turned into a tube like this way. Uh, this is the, uh, the support system, and this is a typical daytime view. The, the, tremendous success. It totally did what it was trying to do. That is to save the old downtown, to keep people there. Or at least pe people have to come and see this show. It's just a must if you go to Vegas. And so that's what was necessary. And of course, the, 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 there are nine uh, major stakeholders that live on the street that, that all were part of the paying for it, plus the city. Next. Okay, this is the one that's going on right now. It's Mallorca, you know, the, the island of Mallorca. There's Mallorca, Menorca, mm, Ibiza, Formentera, or the Balearic Islands, which lay right off the coast of Spain. Um, Barcelona is it's a one hour, only a half an hour pain flight from Barcelona. The main city of the whole thing is Palma, which is right here, which, as you can see clearly, it has an, the ancient, the medieval art of the city, which is those, you can see the, the wall, and then the modern part of the city, which goes over here, a port, and then it has these various port accessories going around, plus this gigantic mole that sticks out. It has a lot of history to it, and that's our site to develop that thing. And this is it here going out into the water. And we are, we are uh, collaborating with a Spanish architect named Carlos uh, Ferrantes, who's a really great guy, but not good, very much good at collaborating. So we're having a little bit of a go at it right now, but I think it'll be fine. Next slide. The early drawings of it were to take, the, the theory was to take the, literally the, the district of the city upon which we attach ourselves and extend the city right out here. So the theory of being on a pier isn't really necessarily uh, clear, and then cut through the thing to cut canals and water that would go from the protected harbor out to the sea, and then to create all kinds of systems. To move. Everybody will want to drive out in a car to see everything, and so they can just drive out and turn right around and drive back. Or they walk out, because this all attaches to the main pedestrian street of the city's right there. Oh, excuse me, I think I'm wrong. No, it's over here. And this, everything just flows right into here, so that one never senses that you've, you've, you've transferred from one thing to another, even though you cross a fairly sizable boulevard to do it here. Everything is driven by the cathedral, which is right there. So the whole project can't be over 11 meters high, which is roughly 33 feet, and it's 2,000 feet long. So 30, 33 feet high and 2,000 foot long is roughly the shadow of that paper right there. I mean, it's a real piece of work, you know. And so these were the very first beginnings of creating the movement diagrams and the water flow diagrams and then the zones of the city. And this is a classic case of field, field and armature work for us. Now, because the Spanish architect is, a, is an architect's architect, a thing maker, we saved all the proboscises for him 
to build, um, you know, buildings in the conventional sense of building, and, he, and that's, uh, that is precisely appropriate, by the way, and it seems to have been something that was interesting for him. It's gotten somewhat murky right now, but hopefully it'll get cleared up. Next. And these are all you'll be looking at here is, is various forms of, of uh, <clears throat> field and armature manipulations. What we wanted to do um, is, it, is all about morphing. This is the truly Gothic city, uh, which has a very unique signature roof, roof tile, a color. The, the city is somewhat colorful, but with a very specific set of perhaps five or six colors. There's a very, very defined landscape uh, sort of language and whatnot, and as is there is in this main boulevard we attach to. So what we want to do is to, is to very gently morph from that medieval colored city th out along this 2,000 feet and to come out on the other end and, and be as if we were water and to go through epochs of time with, of course, the main body being current time and to do so in a, in a series of roof shapes that would be um, somewhat fluid-like, drifting out as you went along. And when you're very close into the city, as you are right here, the roof forms are very much like the forms of the roof of the city. As you begin to move out of this zone, they become more of a series of loping barrels, or barrel walls. All of these other lines are the major boulevards of the city as they are generated out onto the site. There's a tremendous amount of complexity that's not worth talking about here. It's a really great project if you think, if, if, for, because of the need to be, create both the seamless sense plus create a whole new place. You know, it's because to build just more of the same of what they already have isn't really getting too much done. But to start with that and then begin to morph your way out into something else I think is really worthwhile ending up in a park at the end and the sea. Next. These are just varieties of armatures. Um, I wanted to make the, the automobile experience, that is to come and look at the city and look at the harbor, a real, a real doozer. So we brought this up way high in the air like one of our off ramps, in LA freeways, and bring it back down into the city. And there's a lower part of the city and an upper part of the city always, and everything is always about lowers and uppers. And then these are morphing. This is uh, morphing window wall relationships. You start off with a very tight punched wall. Business is out here and you end up with no wall out there. Uh, color. Um, uses. Um, the way, the, the, that's what these were as a series of diagrams of the morph condition without being specific as to where it would happen as you moved out. Next. Um, this is our Carlos, our guy that we're working with. And sort of there was a kind of a lot of silence coming from him because his world was pretty specific. And all of a sudden he sends us this drawing, which is two lizards. A lizard looking that way and a lizard looking this way. And he tells me that the Lizard is the symbol of Mallorca. And somehow in seeing this, he saw lizards. So the whole thing, this is kind of where it's kind of going a little bit left right now, is trying to, and then this was the real lizards he wants with ribs and, and spine and the whole thing. Um, so we're betwixt and between right now. Uh, and I'm, we're really trying our damnest to be very honorable and to be collabor collaborative and so on and so forth. Uh, with everybody, and, and there's, it's a truly an art form to try to learn how to do that and not turn soft and spongy, you know, and kind of give up the ship. Um, but we're, it isn't accomplished yet by, a, by seriously long means. That, however, is the plan roughly right now. Next, these, we have elevations of the project, but they mean nothing. It's an elevation right there. Uh, but it, if there's any reason to, to want to trust me, trust me, it's going to be phenomenal. And the models just left on the plane today, very rough, the first cut version of the whole thing, which is the real life encounter with our Spanish partner, um, and then leading up to, uh, you know, an ultimate presentation. Next. 
This is one that I was one of the most excited. I'm really into this idea of collaboration, and I, and I felt that one of the things that would be worthwhile would be a collaboration with not an architect, but rather an artist or something like that. And Bob Graham was a guy who, you know, he's the fellow who does these incredible figure, figurative sculptures of females, generally. Um, he did the uh, symbolic to the male and female torsos as the symbol of the 84 Olympics. And I hated his guts because he was a pompous, sort of stuck-up guy, and he just didn't, you know, he was over, sort of, I don't know, but he just didn't, really didn't like him. Many years went by, and I had to take one of my clients to see him because this client happened to be a na naked lady freak. So I thought, well, there, here's the place for him. And so he went over to talk to him, and I listened to Bob talk. And I said, geez, this guy's great. He's not the guy I think he is, isn't the guy he is. And with that, we became very good friends. And one of my theories about design is that, in fact, design, the ultimate the underlying language of design is that the human is the female figure. And the, this is not sexist because it works in every way you can imagine, but those lines and curves and proportions and setups, even though they now get very complicated by layering and layering and layering out in time, are, are, are fundamentally driven from that underlying idea. And I thought, therefore, Bob, being probably one of the great masters of, of the female form, working utterly in a world that has nothing to do with females and forms and all that sort of thing, to collaborate with me on this project in Mexico City. And then I, you know, and he's, and he's Mexican. Um, and so that began a very exciting collaboration. And it all began for me with a guy, my client, calling me up. It's the Reichman brothers. They just did. But, Canary Wharf and Battery Park City and so forth, saying, can you get us out of a 100-foot hole in the ground gracefully? I said, sure. And uh, so that's what it really is. That's 100 feet. It's an old quarry down depression in the ground, and that's grade. And these are, this is a seriously ugly and awful freeway. That's Mexico City over there. And this was to be the, the kind of home base for a vast office development of many, many towers and so forth. But this was kind of where this was where civility would occur, this little piece here, down in this hole. <clears throat> and it has a lot of parts to it, residential and hotels and all kinds of other things. But the project was to get from the top down to the bottom. And next slide. And we worked with Legoretto. He was right, he's right at the bottom here with us. Now oh, we have to change boxes here in one second. This is almost over. You're all getting. Okay, this is, as you've seen, some of the, this is a lot, a lot of how I work. I work without regard to pencils and you know that sort of thing. This is a painting on the back of my, my, my five-year-old son's drawing book, which I ripped out and drew, painted on the back of, of the Mexico project. And it, and it became clear to me it was an arc and an and a axis. The main axis, the formal boulevard of the city going up the hill, an arc, the more flané, part of the city, that is, where you move you know, with, with pleasure slowly. And remember, you're going down 100 feet. And, and then these are cross relationships between the boulevard and the Flané Street, all of these in here. And these will make sense in just a minute. And then this is the bar, we call the bar building, which is the thing that goes up and down the hill. And this is the arc building. And then the residentials over here. These really work for me to do this what kind of way. This is one of the smaller subset spaces. We have the arc building, and I'm now in the middle of the space here trying to sort things out in this zone in here with that drawing. Next, next slide. This is the evolution of the ultimately the bar and the arc. And this is me working alone right now, and then Graham shows up not long from now. But it's working out the difference between the arc and the bar and all the varieties of relationships it could have there. Next. Same story here. And the, the biggest thing is the arc in the bar is pretty clear. The, what isn't quite clear is how you get from one to the other. And, and remembering you're going to make a, a hill climb of 100 feet as you're moving up. And so you really want to do it in a, in a, uh, you know, in a wandering kind of way. Uh, and these are each different, different versions of uh, coming closer and closer and closer to the answer. Next. 
This is a thing I diagram I did for the Reichmans just to show them what's going on here. This is the basically the grid of Manhattan where you have the avenues and the boulevards going up here and down there. And that whereas the, boule the uh, boulevards, which are the cross streets, 82nd Street, that sort of thing, uh, in Manhattan are straight and, and grid-like. They don't need to be. They could be whatever you wanted to make in terms of the crossover bars and so forth. And we were trying to climb up this mountain. So I said, if you climb, climbed up 100 feet, that's the path you would make when you did it. And if it was in an arc and bar language, that's what it would look like. And so then the crossovers become those. And you see, that's actually the plan of the project as it finally resulted, which is this plan here. So it, it does make a sort of sense. Next. This is, a, is actually at the figure ground of the um, an elevation of the, the, uh, the island, which looks very much like a lizard, funnily land. Lizards all over. And these are the cross rhombus kind of thing. And this is the, the sweep of the 100-foot drop. And that's the sweep of the building. And so on. Now, this really got exciting. And uh, Bob was trying to create the, the Mesoamerican brick. you are totally sure what that was. But <clears throat> he was hard at it. And then all of a sudden, the peso devalued and put the end of the project. And now it all sits in shelves. And they just showed up to crank it back up to life again. And I really hope it does, because the collaboration I want to complete, and there's a lot of learning curve when you collaborate with Robert Graham, let me tell you. And so we'd love to take round two and, you know, and to be able to sort of uh, smooth it. Next. This is the kind of an over plan. That's the, so the space between. And this is the. <clears throat> I have no clue what that is. Well, it's, it's nice, though, isn't it? Next. <laughs> this is one of the, the exciting job projects. Um, Manco, Hari. Manco Hari. I just had to find out the name. Which is a very funny deal. And, and this is, was pr prior to the bub bubble bursting in the Japanese economy. And you know, J Japan. First of all, it works it, for years. I mean, Japan always works under slogans. Miti creates a slogan, and everybody follows the slogan. And at first, that made this crazier now. How could they do that? And then I began to figure out what it was, and it really is a genius idea. The slogan is like a North Star. So whether you're fixing shoes or cars or designing buildings or operating on hearts, do everything you do, but just keep that North Star navigationally in mind. And that's sort of how it all works. Now, what happened, and they shift the, um, the uh, slogan about every seven years. Well, as they moved into present time, the, the new one is to honor the common man, because pretty much the common man has, has been the engine upon which the great Japanese story has been told. But the price was tremendous. Suicides, broken families, you know, drunks, the whole nine yards. So now the desire was, to not do that, but rather to bring people together. Well, one of the other things that was a little bit elusive in that, this era was leisure. They didn't really have a clear understanding of how to deal, what to deal with leisure. So this project is a university of leisure, if you can imagine. And you come to this thing, and you can anything you think you like, like canoeing, or camping, or skiing, or fishing, or underwater work, there's a, there a trail that you can take that will cross you through the various divisions of issues you need to know about. Fashions, books, equipment, cameras, all that sort of deal. And it sits uh, in this little town, of, uh, the town of Makahari, which is right next to the uh, Kansai, no, the Kansai, the, uh, uh, no, whatever it is, airport, the main Tokyo airport. And it sits right beside it. And it's a new town called Makahari, which is coming out of the ground. But then the bubble break stopped it, stopped all projects. And uh, hopefully this will re, re, re come back to life again. Next. It was an interesting project because it was a very simple box, four little boxy towers with each one of the towers eased out so as to form a sphere when they all came together. And this is missing on the slide over here. And there, there's a terrestrial world below and a celestial world above. 
and Mitsubishi was the client, so with the celestial world would have been some variation of this idea of these illuminated things we were doing. It's open through an oculus to the sky, and in, hidden in these many levels are the, all the various kinds of pursuits that one would might want to have, and they're linked together by these cross pathways and all sorts of devices that interlock this into a very complex matrix, the bottom of which is a water, which of course is a place for water sports and thing, all the equipment that would be related to that. Um, the project was stopped by the economy, but I love the idea of this simple box with this hidden, I mean, it's the old, what you call them, the egg, in the Easter, you know, you look at the egg, with this hidden uh, sphere as an anti-shape inside of it, and so it has no shape statement at all, it's just this box. And so I'm very, very happy about this project, even though it never got built. Next. Stephanie, the lady next to me, insisted I drew this, and we all know what that is, is you go outside the grid. <laughs> well, that's, I did it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's the box. That's the four towers. That's the oculus, so forth. Next. Now, we've always been uh, horizontal guys, girls. Now, all of a sudden, we've been invited into the tower world. Uh, but of a unique sort that I can't really tell you what sort it is nor where it is, but just to kind of show you really fast a bunch of things that have been dealt, murked up on the tower world. We're talking 30 to 50 stories here. Next. And then here, this is a building that is attaches to it. And the next. And you can see what, we're, what these are, very simple. <clears throat> degradations of geometry, circle to square to triangle to, to, to rotated 45 degrees, and all the permutations of that sort of an idea. Next, then the complifying idea of a cone, that it works, it plays off against all these things, and then additionally complifying it by making it not a round, but an ellipse. And so all the same story I just said before, the litany of progression or degradation is so here too. Next. And next, and this is the one that's currently the, 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 you know, the new kid on the block right here. Is a, this is a 50-story tower from there to there. And this is a gl glass cone that is like a, it's in effect an atrium that fell outside, you know, that sticks outside in these raised levels. And it's very exciting. And we, I never much cared much about towers at all. But now this is really getting me excited, and uh, we're all excited in the office. We're very excited about this, and, and, uh, and there's one step beyond this now, which killed the cone, um, but we'll see. I think that's it, right? Yeah. Good. This was uh, not too uh, burdensome, and it's, you see, this is not. This is the work for the common man, which this stuff's all about. So it is. It doesn't have certain aspects of other sort of things about it. But I hope it was interesting. Was there anybody have any questions? Either public questions, you can come up to me afterward and ask anything you like. No. Well, thank you very much. No, we got a question. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold them. Hold them. Oh, very, very quick. I mean, most of this stuff is, you know, we've done them so many times, it's just like you, you automatically know what the whole tree of exit quarters, elevators, stair systems, what the kind of the, the uh, untempered with, un untampered with kind of core armature is like, knowing you have to warp it into that. So that's usually in mind right from the get-go. And most of these crazy drawings already know that that's in there. Um, but these, the, from the things I've shown you, which are pretty much my kind of drawings, which are those real sloppy things, it goes very quickly into a very tight drawing, which I didn't show you, uh, because it's obvious it would do that. And then it stays tight pretty much all the way from that point on. And then, 
because we're only a design we're only design firm very early on everybody comes else comes into it the structural people and the you know whatever they are the wall people and all that kind of stuff next any other questions okay well then now thank you very much Was it?